much to offer holy one I'm humbled by all that you've done and even though I walk through the valley I don't have to fear no you have called me from my sorrow to gladness and I have you what more could I want to so raise my faith up higher set my spirit on fire Lord we're asking you to move you're the God of restoration the one who gives us salvation
prayer this morning, church, revival would come and that his kingdom would reign here on earth. And we are going to start our, our morning this morning with a very special baby dedication. So Pastor Alan, come forward and we're going to do something very special this morning. Really reflective of the sermon last week. And most people probably think that I picked this because of this sermon last week. I picked this like, I don't know, six weeks or two months ago, but just happened to be on this Sunday. So as we sing this great song, this great hymn, I want you to just cast your mind back and remember the sermon from last week as we um, think about the fact that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And we believe that as a church. Amen? Let's sing together.
shouldst die for me. Amen. You can have a seat this morning as we dim the lights and watch a baptism video. I have been a believer since I was a young child. I was always told that I was baptized at a young age until I recently discovered that I was not. Um, I was not lied to, I was just a misunderstanding of what baptism means. Um, my life has not been perfect as a Christian, and with all the changing seasons of my life, I realize that every day is a choice to pick up the cross and follow Jesus. My Christian walk is not is a constant journey. Sometimes I catch on quickly, sometimes I'm a bit more slow, but I strive to always be more like Christ, just as in John 3.30. Um, I want to increase in Him and decrease in me. Christ died for my sins and now lives in my heart. I'm getting baptized today not only in obedience to God, but to publicly, pro publicly proclaim to all that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Um, one verse that really stuck out to me as I was preparing for this day is Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I that who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm Steph Bowder, and I'm not even sure how or where or when this all happened, but what I do know for certain is that after 30 years of, going, of not going to church, I walked into David's for the very first time on the Sunday that Pastor Christian was preaching a sermon about dead faith. Uh, I know for certain now that Jesus bought me, I know for certain now that Jesus paid for me with his own blood. I know for certain now that I am dead to sin and alive in Jesus. I know for certain now that I belong to Jesus and he belongs to me forever, no matter what. I know for certain now that the Holy Spirit of the Son of God lives inside of me. He teaches me, he leads me, he instructs me, he convicts me, he tests me. He challenges me to choose to trust and rely on Him, not myself, in all things. He challenges me to choose to trust and rely on Him and His will, not mine, in all things. He challenges me to choose to trust and rely on His timing, not mine, in all things. I have felt the immovable security of His peace. I have felt the unbreachable safety of his love and there is nothing like it. If you look back on your yesterday and are not overcome with the same sense of awe and wonder, he wants you to fall down on your knees and surrender your everything to him. Surrender your fears to him, not just some of them, all of them. Surrender your grief to him, not just some of it, all of it. Surrender your will and your timing and your control and your addiction and your hurts and your pain and your finance for financial problems, all of it. Surrender everything to him. Drop the flesh and pick up the spirit and don't look back. Put your faith in Jesus. Um, the day I was saved, I remember a specific moment was probably when I was actually in the shower. I was really young. I was growing up in church all my life, but I felt like before then it was kind of more like I just didn't know enough. I was too young. So the more specific moment I can remember was in the shower. I remember accepting Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and then from then on, uh, I'm at the journey here at David's, and it's been great. I have grown so much in Christ. And the reason I want to be baptized is because even though I know I'm saved now, I feel like I should still do it. I just want to have a personal identity with Him. I want to have that personal identity with others within this church and along all of my other brothers and sisters in Christ just knowing that we're under his authority and I just want to have that personal relationship with him in this baptism.
All right. I told you this was a special Sunday, okay? Now we have some baptismal candidates that we are going to, uh, you just heard their testimonies, and we are going to now uh, baptize them as a public profession of their faith in Jesus Christ. But again, just like baby dedication, as we just said, this is not salvation. Uh, salvation has happened in their hearts. You just heard their testimonies, that they have repented and believed in Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Now they are coming before their church family, you all, to let you know publicly before all of you that they are Jesus Christ. And that's what they are coming to do now. And I'd like to invite our first baptismal candidate, Christy Lauer, to come now. All right. Christy Lauer, based on your profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Stephanie Bowder, I'd like to invite you to come now. There you go. Stephanie, based on your profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Andy Miller, is it your testimony that you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes. And I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Austin Pfeiffer is going to come now, and Austin's going to give his testimony here from uh, the pool instead of on video. So, Austin, come now and share. Your testimony, faith in Lord Jesus Christ. Good morning. My name is Austin Pfeiffer. I'm 25 years old. I grew up in the valley all of my life, most of my childhood life. I've attended the church with my family. I've always known the way to salvation it was through Jesus and his mission. I thought I knew all the ins and the outs of redemption and salvation, but throughout my early 20s, I've seen a great deal of Jesus Christ in the hospitals the schools, the churches, on the streets, in broken homes, many nursing homes, and all sorts of places throughout the world. I've come to know him through the difficult moments and the most exciting moments, but through the past couple of years, I've come to know the true and the living Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior. In Jesus' ministry, I've learned that all people he blessed and healed were not blessed and healed by a magical power alone, but by the power of faith. It is today I claim the power of faith by submitting my fleshly being to the one who has sent me to do his work. This day is a day that marks my divorce to the service of sin and a marriage to the service of Christ. Jesus said, if you cannot confess me before men, I will not confess you before my Father. I do this not because I have to, but because I was called to. The way of this modern world keeps shouting, now is the accepted time. No greater time to come to the cross than now. If Jesus is who we are to mimic, and we are made in his image, then just as Jesus was baptized, so shall I. I believe Jesus Christ died for my sins and that he lives within me. And as long as he resides within my heart and soul, I shall live forever. Amen. Austin, based on your profession of faith in Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, I baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son. Spirit. All right. Well, we just want to say a big welcome. Aren't you glad you're in church this morning? What an awesome Sunday to be here, to see people being dedicating their lives to Christ, children being dedicated, baptisms happening. There's just so much amazing stuff the Lord has in store for us today, but we want to say a big welcome to our guests who are here. I know we have some first-time guests here. Please uh, fill out this little card. Um, it's in your seat back in front of you. 
who can fill that out and bring it to me through the double doors after the service. And uh, I will exchange that for a Dunkin' Donut gift card so you can go out and get a spice latte or something of that sort. Also, we have a concert coming to David's Recreation. It's coming here on uh, November the 13th. I think we have a slide for this one. Um, November the 13th at 6 p.m. And uh, they're going to be right here in our, in our uh, worship center. And it's going to be a great concert. They, they do some uh, like patriotic songs. They do worship songs. They do gospel songs, all kinds of different stuff. And their voices are so amazing. Pastor Alan was like, they have to have auto-tune. And I went and checked and uh, asked them. They said, nope, we don't use any auto-tune. So it was pretty, uh, pretty awesome to hear them sing. Their harmonies are just fantastic. So come out. Uh, there will be, I believe, a free will offering taken, but the concert itself is free. Um, next, we have our uh, a church photo directory, and this one is awesome. We are at 54%. 54%. 54%. But as, as Pastor Danny would say, those are rookie numbers. Those are rookie numbers. I, I want to see this week us get up uh, over 70%. We got to get over 70%. So if you have not had your family's photo taken, please, uh, you don't even have to make an appointment. Just go down after the service today to the large fellowship hall. There's signs right there that'll lead the way. Go right in. It's painless. It takes uh, about a minute or two, you just get right in there, snap a photo, and, uh, and you're in. You can get that done, check that off the list. So do you, can we get to over 70% this week? What do you think, church? Yeah, literally, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. It's a little tepid at first, but we'll, we'll take what we can get here. Next, we have our fall festival volunteers meeting. It's going to be a five-minute meeting in the small fellowship hall after church today. If you're helping out in any way with the fall festival, please go to that meeting right after church, right in the fall, uh, the fall smellowship. Now I'm doing what Danny does, fall smellowship. The fall smellowship hall, and you can have your fall festival training in the fall smellowship. And uh, we have uh, our ushers coming forward at this time. We have youth tonight. Uh, from 6 to 8 p.m., or actually 6 to 8.30 p.m., because they do play dodgeball at the end. So if you come at 8, your kids are going to be screaming at you to stay another half hour. So come at 8.30, let them play dodgeball uh, for 6th to 12th grades, and, um, and we're going to have a great time at youth tonight. And pray for our youth. I mean, we have seen our numbers at youth just climbing, youth coming out, and it's just been an incredible thing ever since, well, growing in, but also when we got into the rock, just seeing those, those youth coming out, bringing their friends. So tonight, set an alarm at six o'clock. Pray for our youth program. We need all the prayer we can get. The, the leaders and helpers need all the prayer they can get. So it's, it's, it's a great time, so please come out. Let me pray for our offering today. Dear Lord, thank you so much just for the joy it is to be here in the house of the Lord today. We are so blessed. Where else would we want to be than sitting right here in the house of the Lord, seeing your Holy Spirit changing lives, seeing people dedicating their lives to you. Pray that we would, each one of us, really set ourselves apart and dedicate our hearts, our minds to you this week. Conform us to the image of your Son, Lord Jesus. Pray that you would just be uh, reigning in our hearts this week. We just submit ourselves to you, Lord. I pray for the offering today that you would bless both the gift and the giver. Let every penny, every cent be used for your glory alone. We pray these things in Jesus' holy name. And all God's children said, amen. amen. And after the plates have passed by you, um, you are welcome to stand and sing and worship with us. Calling 
on the God of Jacob Whose love endures for generations I know that you will keep your covenant I'm calling on the God of Moses The one who opened up the oceans We know our God can do the same thing for us God, my God, I need you. Oh, God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh, rock, oh, rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your the God of Mary, whose favor rests upon the lowly. I know with you all things are possible. I'm calling on the God of David, who made a shepherd boy courageous. I may not face Goliath, but I've got my own giants. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your your children then you hear your children now you are the same God you are the same God you answered prayers back then and you will answer now you are the same God you are the same God you were providing then you are providing now you are the same god you are the same god you moved in power then god move in power now you are the same god you are the same god you were a healer then you are a healer now you
seated on his throne come let us adore him behold our king nothing can compare come let us adore him so God we thank you for your holy 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 a thrice holy God oh God we're so unworthy of your love but God in your in your divine sovereignty you saw fit to reach down when I was dead in my sin when we were dead in our sins and to save us to pull us from that that death that that slavery to sin that we were so enslaved with God and you reached down in your sovereignty and plucked us out and called us your own mm. Jesus thank you for doing that amazing work God thank you for for awakening our hearts Lord we are so unworthy of you and your love but how grateful we are thank you Jesus thank you Jesus for for salvation in your name how we love you love you for it Jesus we pray these things in Jesus name and all God's children said amen brothers sisters come on down to that river guaranteed you'll never be the same there's a fountain flowing from the heart of the savior bring your sins and all your guilty stains let that river of life wash it all away if you've been searching and carrying burdens if you've been lost and looking for a home if you've been drifting and something is missing well, you should know that you are not alone brother No time to waste, open your heart, don't be afraid, jump on in, the water is fine, there's healing in the river of life, come as you are, no time to waste, open your heart, don't be afraid, jump on in, the water is fine, there's healing in the river of life. Brothers, sisters, come on down that river, guaranteed you'll never be the same. You can have a seat this morning as our kids ages four through second grade are dismissed for junior church at this time. Amen. You guys hot? It's hot in here, isn't it? Or is it just me? I feel like I just got out of the hot tub. I got my uh, hanky up here. Chris should be happy. It's a Dunkin' Donuts. It's a Dunkin' Donuts napkin. Oh, 
got the Dunkin' Donut hanging. So. <laughs> All right. What a great Sunday. I feel like I earned my keep on this Sunday. Got a, had a lot of running to do, but what a great Sunday. If you have a child that you'd like to get dedicated back to the Lord publicly, if you need to get baptized, please see one of the staff, see me, call the office. We love to do these things. These are important things. These aren't just, you know, sort of uh, add-ons. These are essential to our faith. In fact, the Bible commands us, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of sins. We're commanded to be baptized. It's not our salvation, as we've said, but it is something very important as we grow in our faith. So please see me, and uh, we'd be glad, so happy to do that. Don't let age or whatever be a problem. I've been going to church for 100 years. That is not a problem at all. So uh, please see me if the Lord is leading you in that. All right, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. I knew I would have less time today, so I uh, made my sermon tw twice as long as usual. No. <laughs> Romans chapter 8. Romans recap. Before we get to 8, remember where we've gone. Let's go back a little bit. Romans chapter 1. Beginning at 1 1 through 3 20, is the, Paul is establishing that we are all sinners. We are all sinners separated from God. We are under the wrath of God. We are unacceptable to God. We are under the judgment of God. We are on our way to hell. That's chapter 1 through chapter 320. In chapter 320, something beautiful and amazing happens as we begin to see Paul outline the scriptures. But now there is a righteousness apart from the law in Christ Jesus. We could be justified, redeemed. We could be saved. We could be forgiven. That starts in. Uh, Romans 3 verse 21 it goes all the way through chapter 5 Paul is establishing justification through faith alone it's beautiful section of scripture of salvation we are justified completely declared righteous in Christ Jesus positionally we have been forgiven and made right with God we are forgiven and we have been justified by the imputation of Christ's perfect life declared righteous in him saved redeemed, whatever, born again. Those words all apply to that section if we believe. Chapter 4, we see through the life of Abraham that we are justified by faith alone, not by works based on Abraham's life. In chapter 5, we are no longer in Adam under sin. We are in Christ, forgiven. Chapter 5. Chapter 6, we are slaves to God, slaves to Christ. Chapter 7, we still struggle with sin. An important chapter, a depressing chapter, chapter 7. But you got to get through chapter 7 and let the truth of chapter 7 weigh on you, feel the weight of your sinfulness in your flesh to get to chapter 8 where we open chapter 8 as we saw the atomic bomb of truth, the, the, the sunrise of a, of a million suns, the beauty and brightness. There is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Take it to the bank. Romans 8.1. Put it in your memory bank. Make sure you know it. Live by it. Wield it as a weapon against doubt and sinfulness. Romans 8.1. One of these beautiful, beautiful, powerful verses we spent last Sunday talking about. Now what? Now, we, we know there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. We are forgiven completely. No matter what chapter 7 says, we struggle with sin, but we struggle as those uncondemned, non-condemned, forgiven completely. Now what? Now what do we do? Now, verse 4, where we left off, verse 4 begins a section on sanctification. That's the, the big theological word that we grow in our faith. If you're a believer today, there's no condemnation. Now what do I do? You grow. You walk, not according to the flesh that's dead, but not gone. Your flesh, your sinful flesh is dead, but not gone. Crucified with Christ. But in, in, this, in this plane, in this life, it's still there to hamper our walk with the Lord. We don't walk according to the flesh. We walk according to the Spirit now that we are believers. That's where we're going. Romans 8. And I'm going to start in verse 4, overlap from last week, and read to verse 8. Romans 8, 4 to 8. This is God's Word for us today. Those who are in the flesh... Well, excuse me, that's verse 8. Let's start at verse 4. Um... In order that, there's no condemnation, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on things of the Spirit. For to set your mind on the flesh is death, but to set your mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, hates God, hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. 
But those who, are in the, uh, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Verse 8. This is God's word for us today. Let's ask him to bless our time in his word. Heavenly Father, we pray now on this Lord's day as we've seen parents dedicate themselves to the task of raising the next generation to know you. As we've seen Christians come before you publicly for all to see proclaim their love for you and their allegiance to you. As we've sung these songs, as you've moved in our midst, we now come before your throne of grace boldly through the blood of Jesus Christ, corporately together, and ask for your blessing on your word today. Teach us, instruct us. Lord, we want to be Christians who walk according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh. Help us to do that today. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's begin our time here together with the definition of sanctification. As we said, this begins uh, our section on sanctification. And in your program or on your app, I put a definition for sanctification. It's one we've heard before. It's from Wayne Grudem. When I say Grudem or Wayne Grudem, we get our theological definitions from Grudem's Systematic Theology. It is a book that's for sale out in our bookstore shelf out there. You can pick that up, and wherever we see a word or try to understand a a theology a little bit better, we go to Grudem. That that book is not inspired. It's not scripture. It helps us. It's a tool to help us understand God's word better. So we go to Grudem, and we get a definition of sanctification, a progressive work of God and man that makes us more and more free from sin and more and more like Christ in our actual lives. It is Uh, to, To put simply, our process of growth, how we grow as Christians, sanctify. Sank is the the word holy, the Greek word holy. It's how we are made holy. We're declared righteous, or excuse me, declared righteous through our justification. We are being made holy in our sanctification. A couple points. Number one, this is a partnership. This is a partnership work. We work together with the Holy Spirit. Justification is God's work alone. It's monogenistic. God does that to us, for us, in us, declared righteous. Sanctification after salvation is something we do along with the Holy Spirit. We work together in our growth. But let me say this. When I say partnership, don't think equal partnership. It's not an equal partnership. Our sanctification is not 50% Holy Spirit, 50% us. It's like 99.9% Holy Spirit and like 0.1% us. It's not an equal partnership. Yes, we both work at our growth and becoming holy, but it is a work of God, a supernatural work of God wrought in your life by the work of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's like a partnership. I, I can't think of a better illustration than this, so, so forgive me if this sounds ridiculous, but it's, it's like getting on a plane, right? You get on a plane... That's the partnership. You have a partnership with the plane and the pilot and you. Your job is to yield to the plane. You get in, you follow the instructions, you put the seatbelt on, but it is the plane that does the work. You're not flying. The plane is flying you. The plane is doing the work, but you're in a partnership with the plane simply by your obedience and your yielding. Get in the the plane, sit down, keep your mouth quiet, put your mask on, put the seatbelt on, and let the pilot get you there through the plane. That's That's our sanctification process. Yes, we have to yield to the work of the Holy Spirit. We need to obey the Scriptures through the Holy Spirit, but it is a work of God on our, in our life. Secondly, it's a practical work. We never arrive at perfection. It is a lifelong, progressive, practical work. Positionally, we are perfect, declared righteous, justified in God. Practically, day by day, in this life, while we are alive, living, breathing in this realm, we will never be perfect. We are being made on a daily basis more like Jesus, more holy, more obedient. But don't get discouraged in your walk in sanctification because remember verse 1 of chapter 8. You are no longer condemned. Don't be discouraged in how long it takes for you to become holy. God is doing a work. God is doing a work in your life. It's going to take a lifetime. You will never get there, but you continue to go, but you are no longer condemned. This is a progressive work. There are ups and downs. I put my chart up. You've seen this chart before. You've had it in your notes. You have it on your notes, but this is the chart we sort of use to try to understand the difference between justification and sanctification, right? Justification, that's God, God's level. He is perfect, he is holy. There is no sin in God. That is the level that God is on. We are sinful. Uh, Romans 3.10, there is none righteous, no, not one. We are on our way to hell. Two parallel lines will never 
intersect. That's the reality of life. But God in his goodness chooses to save us. And when he saves us, he justifies us completely. We are declared righteous and we are brought up positionally to that line. See, now the blue and the black line are together. We now are positionally completely justified clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Christ's righteousness, his perfection is imputed to us. Therefore, as we stand before God, clothed in the righteousness of Christ, he sees not our sins, he sees Christ's perfect life. You've heard that before, but i got to keep saying it. You know, I don't know what the rule is, but to understand something, you have to say it like a hundred times. So I don't think I've said it a hundred times yet. I'm on my way. But it's so important we understand that. Now, sanctification is that squiggly line where we are justified, but now in this life, on this plane... In the days that the Lord gives us on earth, He is making us holy. He is sanctifying us. And your line it goes up and down, right? Hills and valleys. But hopefully as you step back from your life over the years, you are seeing a life that's trending towards God. And yeah, you go through seasons. You go through sometimes years, sometimes decades of sinfulness. That's, that's, the, that's how the, our faith works. But over time, we are seeing ourselves being made righteous in Christ. That's the work of sanctification. And that's the work that the Apostle Paul is going to talk about in the rest of chapter 8. Today, in verses 4 to 8, we're going to see four changes the Holy Spirit brings to us after salvation. Number one, he gives us a new direction, a new walk. Number two, he gives us a new way of thinking, a new mind. Number three, he gives us a new affection, a new love that we never had before. And then fourthly, he gives us a new goal in life. Those are the four things uh, that the Holy Spirit, among other things, uh, gives us in salvation. The first thing the Holy Spirit does after salvation, it gives us a new direction. We, we move in a completely different direction than we were going in before salvation. Verse 4, let's read that again. Eight, Romans 8, 4. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, comma, that's justification. The righteous requirement of the law is fulfilled in us through Christ's life. He's speaking about justification there, that we meet the requirement of the law. We are perfect according to the law because we are clothed in righteousness. That's our justification, comma. Now he switches to sanctification, who walk, who walk, who live, some they say, who live and walk, not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. That's our sanctification. It comes after justification, never before. Never before. Now that we are justified, now, 4B, we can be sanctified. We can walk in newness of life. We're brand new people. We have a new heart. We have a new desire. We have a new mind. We have a new spirit. We are new creatures in Christ, and we are walking in a completely different direction now. Hallelujah. We're not who we were. We're not going where we used to go. We're going in a different direction. We are living in a different way. This is a new walk. This is not the old walk. This is a brand new walk after salvation. We are walking 100 degrees different than we used to walk. It's a steady walk. This can be discouraging to some of us because once we come to faith, we want to run. And sometimes we do run. Very rarely. We don't crawl either, though. We walk. It's a steady progression in the right direction. Our faith is a steady walk in the right direction. God has picked us up. He's turned us around 180. He set us in the opposite direction, and we walk. I love that picture. It's a picture of movement, of steady movement. It's not a run. It's not a crawl. It's not a standstill. We're not backsliding. We're not walking backwards. We are slowly and steadily progressing to heaven. Think of Pilgrim's Progress. Think of that beautiful story of that allegory of walking to the celestial city, walking to heaven. We are going to get there. It's going to take time. It's a Godward walk. We're not walking for our, to fulfill our own selfish desires. We don't have the same means and goals in our lives. We've been completely changed. We're moving in a different direction towards God, and it's a long walk. It's a walk that will last all the days of your life. You'll never get there in this life. You will get there the moment you open your eyes in heaven and see the face of Jesus. You have gotten there. But while on earth, in this plane, in this time, we walk, and it's a long walk. Been a Christian for a long time. You've been, maybe been a Christian for a long time. Take some time to think about it, to meditate, to remember who you were. And then you see who you are now. Don't get, so many of us get discouraged. We get caught up in the moment and our, and our defeats and, our, and, and the things we get tripped up in. But, but take a moment and be encouraged. I am not who I should be, but I am no longer who I used to be. Those are both true. Yes, I got a ways to go. Yes, sin still entraps me and trips me up more than I wish it did. Romans chapter 7. 
but I'm not who I used to be. God's changed me incredibly. Take some time and remember this walk, where you started and where you are headed to. We have a new direction. We walk. We walk, it says, not according to the flesh, verse 4. In order, um, in order that the righteous requirement be filled with us, who walk not according to the flesh. The word flesh in this passage is 13 times. Again, Paul is reminding us that the spirit and the flesh are in conflict. There's a contrast here. Our flesh means our sinful nature. Romans 7, this sinful nature. Now, in Christ Jesus, you are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. That sinful nature is dead. You are no longer under the power or penalty of the sinful flesh. However, in this fallen world, it's still here. It's still present, right? Keep killing it. Stop going to the cemetery and digging up the zombie of your sinful flesh. It's still here. It still haunts us. But we don't walk according to it because it is dead. One day in heaven, it'll be gone. Stop living in the flesh. That's chapter 7. Live with no condemnation. Walk towards Christ. Here's the, here's the important thing you need to remember as a Christian. As a believer in Jesus Christ, if you are saved, if you believe in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord, saved, like we just heard, if that's your testimony, and you believe in Jesus Christ, here's the truth. Here's the promise. You don't have to live according to the flesh anymore. That's the promise. You don't have to walk in your old ways. You don't have to walk in sinfulness and discouragement and shame anymore. So stop. Stop. You can stop. You can choose. Before Christ, you had no choice. You could only walk in that direction. But now that you know Jesus Christ, you can make up your mind and you can choose to walk in newness of life. So arise from the dead and walk in newness. Stop walking in your flesh. That's who you used to be. Remind yourself, when you see yourself going back to the old ways, say, that's not who I am anymore. That's not who, that's not, that's old Alan. That Alan was crucified with Christ. No longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the power, and the life I now live, I live by the power of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I'm new. Don't walk according to the flesh. Make the choice to walk according to the Spirit. Thirdly, we we walk according to spirit, not according to the flesh. The the word spirit shows up 21 times in the first 37 verses. Paul is giving us this this contrast again. Flesh and spirit. Walk according to spirit. Make that choice to walk according to the spirit. Galatians 5, 22 to 23 gives us a picture of a Holy Spirit walk, a life that lives according to the Holy Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there's no law. These are the kind of fruits that are being born in your life as you walk to God, Godwardly through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what your life looks like. It's no longer dominated by the flesh. 1 Peter 4 gives us a picture opposite of the fruit of the Spirit. It says this, this is what the Gentiles do. They live in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, lawless idolatry. That's how they live, verse 4. And with respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery. What a great phrase. Flood of debauchery and they malign you. Are there people in your life who malign you and say, why don't you live in the flood of debauchery that I live in? What's wrong with you? Why don't you run to the excesses that I run to? What's wrong with a little extramarital affairs? What's wrong with a a little pornography? What's wrong with a little drugs or or whatever you you, you, you pick your poison? What's wrong with that? Have a little fun. Cut loose. I'm shocked that you don't hang with the old crowd anymore. I'm shocked that you don't do those things anymore. What's wrong with you, right? You should hear that as a Christian. That's what it says. But you have a life that is now displaying the fruit of the Spirit because you're walking according to the Spirit and the Holy Spirit is changing you. He changes our direction. He puts us in a different way. He empowers our walk. When you choose to walk according to God's Word to fulfill God's law and live for Jesus, there is a supernatural power that will enable you to do that. It's not you. It's the Holy Spirit who will do that in you. That's a promise. So, So take that chance. Take that risk. And watch the Holy Spirit flood into your life with his power to help you to do that, to enable you to do it. And here's the best thing of all, I think, number three, the Holy Spirit walks with us. He empowers our walk, but he's right there with us. John chapter 16, Jesus is in the upper room, and he's teaching in the upper room the night before he goes to the cross, and the main theme of his teaching in that section is the Holy Spirit. I'm going to leave. And what does he say? 
it's bad that I'm leaving. No, he doesn't say that. It's the opposite. It's good. It's good I'm leaving you guys. What? Because if I didn't leave, the paraclete wouldn't come. What's the paraclete? The paraclete is the Holy Spirit. Now, now, different translations, it's a hard word to translate. It, ad, the advocate is coming. That's a great word. The counselor, that's another great word. The helper is coming. All these different translations, trying to get to, to the root of this word paraclete. John describes the Holy Spirit as the paraclete. Literally, in the Greek, it means one who comes alongside the paraclete. One who walks alongside. I'm going to send you God, the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, and he is going to empower your walk, but he's going to walk right beside you. He's the power of He's going to be right by you wherever you go. He's going to enable you, empower you. And as you go down that road of life and you face all those obstacles and you face those, those, those pitfalls of suffering and sin, all the things, all the garbage you're going to face in this life, the one that's going to be right beside you is the Holy Spirit. He walks with you. Last Wednesday night, I, I was sort of making fun of, I guess that's just too strong, I wasn't making fun of, I was sort of poking, I was teasing about when we grew up, every single one of us, you grew up in a Christian house, a uh, Christian household, I think it was mandatory you had to have a poem somewhere in your house called Footprints. You had to have footprints somewhere in your house. Some of you still have it in your house. Get with the times, man. Come on. But you remember Footprints, right? That beautiful poem, we all had it in our house. Tammy showed me a picture of her college dorm. She had it up in her college dorm. Boom, there's Footprints, a big poster, right? Holy Spirit walk with us, remember, and then, you, and then you get all upset because you start out and there's two pairs, and then pretty soon, when you go through your hardest times, there's only one pair. You say, where'd you go? Where'd you go? Well, you know, God, you promised you'd be with me. And what does he say? That's when I carried you. It's so corny, really, but it's really good, right? I get choked up just now thinking about it, right? It's so, it is corny, but like, really, it touches you saying that's so true. Those times when I was when I was really suffering, when I was mourning the loss of someone close to me, a child, a, a relative, a spouse, when I was in a hospital room, when, when I was neck deep in sin and I was running so hard against you, you were carrying me through that. That's true. And, and you know that. Every single one of you who's been a Christian for more than a day, you know that that's what, the, that's what God does. He walks with us. He empowers us. And sometimes he picks us up. And sometimes I imagine, too, that as you're walking, you're, you're turning around wanting to walk in the other direction. He's just like, sort of like a dad, like taking the kid and say, uh-uh, just picking them right up when their feet are still going that direction. No, we're not going that way. <laughs> I told you, you get ice cream once a day. Don't run to the ice cream guy. You know, you, you pick them up and you almost have to, against their will, carry them in that direction. Sometimes I think the Holy Spirit has to do that to a lot of us. You don't walk according to flesh. We walk according to the Spirit. Christians, it's the time to ri- arise and walk through the p- empowering work of the Holy Spirit. Walk in newness of life. If you are a Christian who's not growing in their faith, not walking according to the Spirit, one or two things are probably true of you. Number one, you're not a Christian. Christians grow. Number two, you're a disobedient Christian. Those are your two options. You don't want to fall into either one of those options. You need to grow. We need to grow and walk according to the Spirit, not the flesh. Secondly, he's given us a new direction. He's given us a new mind. A a new mind. Look at verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh, they set their minds on things of the flesh, right? They live in sinful nature. They think according to sinful nature. But those who live according to the Spirit, they set their minds on things of the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit comes to our life. He lives inside of us. He dwells inside of us. And He gives us a new direction. He gives us a new way of thinking. Some of us have been Christians for a long time, and we forget that God has not just given us a new heart. He's given us a new mind. We think differently than the world around us. We have a new mindset, a new way of thinking. We are given a new heart and a new mind by the Holy Spirit when we're saved. Now, now, you may wish this happens. This isn't what he's talking about. He's not talking about suddenly you get really smart. It's not like like you get more intelligent when you're a Christian. That would be great if it happened. It doesn't. Uh, You get a new way of thinking, a new mindset. Your mind thinks differently thinks about different things. Christians, by definition, if you're a follower of Christ, you think differently than the world. So we set our minds as believers. The Holy Spirit sets our minds on spiritual things. Here's another thing. You can choose which way to walk. Here's another thing, Christians. You can choose what to think. You can choose what to think. Oh, you don't understand, Pastor. I've lived a life of sin and debauchery. And my mind is is completely corrupted by the world. I can't help. Yeah, you can help. You can choose. You can choose what you watch, what you read, what you listen to, what you put in front of your face. You can choose those things. What you put into your mind is what you think. You can make those choices as Christians every day. You can choose what to think. 
You can choose what you fill your minds with. The battle is usually won in the mind before the actions, right? You lose the battle in the mind before you ever lose it, before you ever do it. You lose it here. That's where the battlefield is. You can choose to think godly thoughts. You have to train your mind to do that. You have to set your mind. So he gives us two things we can set our mind to as Christians. You can set your mind to the flesh or you can set your mind to the spirit. Now the world, their default is flesh. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, your mind is set to flesh and you can't change it. You can't do anything about it. That, you're only going to think worldly thoughts. And if it's set to the flesh, don't necessarily think evil thoughts. It's included in there. Or, or perverse thoughts or sinful thoughts. Just think of a, a mind that is preoccupied with the things of the world. It doesn't necessarily have to be bad things. Here's how Luke 17 describes the days of Noah. Luke 17, 28 to 28. They were eating and drinking, marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark. They were just living their lives. The flood came and destroyed them likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, switches to Lot, that's Sodom and Gomorrah. They were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. He mentions Lot. He could have mentioned homosexuality there. He doesn't, does he? He says they were just living according to the world's thing. They were buying, selling, you know, investing, building barns, planting fields, considering a field and going and buying it, considering how they can prosper, how, how well their kids are going to do. They're preoccupied with the things of the world. And again, none of these things are necessarily evil. They're good things, but the problem is they are dominated by the world's thinking, the world's goals. Buying, selling, marrying, eating, drinking. This is a mind that loves the world, loves the things of the world. 1 John 2, verses 15 and 16 is a scary verse. Do I have it in your, in your notes? It's a scary verse. I don't. It says, if, if you love the world, what? The love of the Father's not in you. That's scary. How much do you love this world? How much do you love the things of this world? If you love them more than you love God, it's saying, you got to be careful. You, you may not be a believer. you got to examine your life. You love the world. You're dominated by the things of the world. And this is a mind that loves death. Here is where the end result of worldly thinking ends. Verse 6. Verse 6. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. Death. And isn't it interesting that our world right now is obsessed with death? We live in a culture that thinks death. Look, look at just take one issue, maybe the main issue, abortion. We live in a culture that is overrun in a culture of death. We have advertisements on TV right now, political advertisements saying, if you give me the senators or the leaders or the congressmen, I will give you national abortion. That's a selling point for people. They're promoting death. If you give me the right people in the right places of power, we will have abortion on demand with no restrictions. You can kill your babies whenever you want, just as long as they're in the womb or halfway in the womb or the head's in the womb, whatever it might be, right up to the moment of birth. And it is such an important thing for them. They're selling it. They're not hiding it. They used to hide it when I was a kid. They didn't want to admit you know, that, they, that they were for that. They're for it. They're for death. That's the world we live in. They celebrate it. They're defined by it. Death. We cannot, brothers and sisters, we cannot be a part of the culture of death. We are part of the culture of life. You should be a one-issue voter. And your one issue that you judge all issues is life. We're believers in Jesus Christ. We believe that we are made in the image of God, that he has crafted us in the womb of our moms. At the moment of conception, if we don't stand for that, if we don't see that in the scriptures, what else is there? What else can you see based on that? That's 101. Life, a mind set on the world is a mind that is set on death. That's what Paul says. We see it. We need to be set to the spirit. Set your mind to the Spirit. The Holy Spirit changes our thinking. You have thoughts in your mind you didn't have before you were a Christian. You want. This is, the, this is the amazing thing. You went from wanting to please yourself, living selfishly, wanting to do everything that would enrich your life, make you better and, and more satisfied and everything. That was your thinking as an as a unbeliever. You weren't necessarily an evil person like we would define evil. 
but your thought was only worldly for what you wanted, the success you could have. But now the Holy Spirit's invaded your life. He lives inside of you. And now your thought life is all different. Now you want to please God. You want to obey God. What? You want to do right by God. You want, you want to give your life to the things of God. You didn't want to do that before you were a Christian. You're, you have a mind like Christ. You have a mind directed towards truth. You love the truth. You have a mind sensitive to sin. You know when you sin, you feel guilty about it. You have a mind that loves God. You have a mind that is always learning and trying to grow in your faith. Those things were not part of your your thought process before you were a Christian. I love. I don't love it, but I, I get a kick out of all Christians. I don't, I don't get a kick out of this either. I, let me just. Christians come to me quite regularly and say, "I don't think I'm a Christian." I usually say, the, the very fact that you think that probably means you are a Christian. Because unsafe people don't come to me like, I don't, I don't think I'm a Christian. They don't care. They don't care. Oh, yeah, me and the big guy, we're okay. That, that's how unsafe people talk. Yeah, I got no problems with Jesus. I'm a Christian, whatever. No, you're not. It's the Christian who is so overcome in their guilt and sinfulness saying, I don't know if I'm a believer because I can't get this thing right. I can't figure this out. My life is a mess. I I sin so easily. Romans 7, they come with Romans 7 on their heart and say, I don't think I'm even a Christian. I say, the very fact that you feel that way means the Holy Spirit's at work in your life. Probably. Because you think differently. The unsaved person doesn't feel guilty about those things. They justify all those things. God wants me to be happy. Of course I I left my wife. God wants me to be happy, right? That's that's how the unsaved talk. Because they don't have a mind that's, that's overcome with the Holy Spirit. A mind that's always learning. That's an important one for us. I highlighted this one in my notes because we want to be a church that, and you've already gotten this, I'm sure, hopefully, that we want to be a church that that is always a a teaching church. We want you to grow in your theology, your doctrine, your understanding of God's Word. We We want you to grow in your love for God. We believe love for God is closely tied with your knowledge about God. When the Apostle Paul talks about his love for Jesus Christ, he says, I want to know Christ. I want to know him more so I can love him more and live for him more. We want to be the kind of church that's always focused on Christian education. That's important to us, Christian education. We want to make sure that every age group and all ages have a a, a space, a place, a group to learn more about God's Word. That's why we have small groups. But one of the things that, that in the past few years we've really tried to focus on, and you've seen this, is, is, is children's Christian education. That's really what we want to be about. That's why we built that building over there. So that we could reach the children, the young people in our community. We, we don't want to forsake the adults or the old folks, no. But we want to really focus on young people. Christian education is a main focus for us. We want to focus on our youth group and our wanna group, our Sunday school groups, our, our, our after school groups where we are reaching young people because we know a few things. Statistics tell us a few things. Number one, if you're going to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord, statistics tell us you do it before you're 18, typically, or 16. I don't know what it is. 80, somebody probably knows. 80%? Young. That's when you're open to the Lord. That's when we want to get you. That's, what, that's when we want to bring you. Second, here's another statistic. This is what Pastor Danny often talks about. And you need to remember if you're a parent, if you are not getting your kid out to church and plugged into our youth program, a WANA program, Sunday school program, the likelihood is that kid will not walk with the Lord when they get older. That is proven statistically. The Southern Baptist, the largest denomination in our country, has done the statistic over and over again. If you're not getting your kid under the teaching of God's word as much as you can, the chances are they'll walk away from the Lord. It's true. It's true. That's another statistic. Here's another, here's another, I don't know, statistic. Here's a commitment. We at David's and leadership at David's, from, from Jill Snyder and all her group that work on, on our Christian education with our kids, we are not willing to lose one kid from David's. Not one. I don't want one kid to go to college and be so flabbergasted and so upset and realize I was taught a lie. Jesus isn't real. There is no God. I do not want one of our kids to do that. I'm not willing to sacrifice any of our kids as your pastor to the world. But you got to help me. we got to do this together as a family of God and make sure that we are all pulling together in the same direction for our kids. Providing a church, making sure it's staffed well, make sure it has the finances, make sure it has the, the proper ministers that are ministering to our kids, make sure the kids are there doing everything we can do to all pull in the same direction that we don't lose any kids. For too long, for too long, we, we, we didn't train our kids, we didn't catechize our kids, we didn't teach our kids, we didn't disciple our kids, whatever the word is, and then they went off to college, even Christian college, 
And we lost them. And we lost them. Some of you have kids, and you're praying for them every day. They grew up in the church. I don't know what happened. Did they grow up in the church? Was that a priority then? We need the corporate aspect of our faith. That's this. And we need the individual. We need both. If you are not programming into your kids a corporate dimension of their faith, church, you are risking their spiritual lives. I don't know if you know what you're risking. I'm telling you right now, if you're not getting your kids out kicking and screaming, I don't care. Throw them on your back, crying and kicking, and get them out here. Right? This is where they belong. Here. If you're not doing that, you are, I, I don't think you know the gamble you are taking. The statistics are against you. You, you might. There's, there's kids, and God's so gracious. There are people that get back on, and that's our, always our hope, and I've seen it so many times. But why, but why take the chance? But why, why take the risk? Why? Because you don't want to get your kid upset with you? Come on. If your kid had a broken leg, would you be like, well, it's your choice if you want to go to the doctor or not? Your choice. <laughs> I, I don't know where I was here. Where are we? <laughs> Running out of time is where we are. Set your mind to the Spirit. A mind set to the spirit leads to life and peace. Look at verse 6. The end of verse 6, the, the spirit set to the flesh is death. The spirit set to the Holy Spirit is life and peace. You know how you know you're walking? Here's one, one way you know you're walking by the spirit. You have peace. You have peace. And man, the testimony of Christians who have walked through the, the biggest nightmares of life, the heart, but yet they have peace. Why? Because they have this. Their mind is set to the spirit. They're seeing things from an eternal perspective. And they have peace, life. We set our minds. How do we set our minds? We set our minds by the Holy Spirit and by God's Word. That's how we set our minds to the things of the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit working in us and God's Word. We renew our minds. Romans 12, 2. Don't be conformed, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. How do we renew our minds? We renew our minds through the Word of God. We train our minds. We program our minds. Program your minds to think godly thoughts. Read godly things. Read scripture. Listen to Christian music. As much as you can, program your mind to think in a Christian manner according to the Spirit. Philippians 4, uh, verse 8 and 9, give us a list of things you should think about. Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are, are, are good, think on these things. Let me go there because it, this is what you program your mind with. Uh, Pastor Allen, I can't control my mind. It always just goes to dark places. It just goes to places I don't want it to go. Lust, greed, whatever. It just, it just flows that way. Okay, okay, here's what you need to do. Paul tells us, Philippians 4, brothers, sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is honorable, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, whatever is excellent, think on these things. Program your mind to think according to the Spirit. You can do this. Set your mind, train your mind to think godly thoughts. Again, the battle is won in our mind, usually. Thirdly, thirdly, God has given us, the Holy Spirit's given us new affections. New affections. Verse 7. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, hates God, is in active disobedience to God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot submit to God's law. Once we are saved, the Holy Spirit gives us a new love, a new affection for God. We love God. We, we, we long for God. We, we, we love God. That's a new thing that the Holy Spirit gave us, a new heart to love God. He changed our loves. He changed our affections. We now want to love and obey and please God. If we live according to the flesh and love the flesh, we'll be hostile to God. There's no neutral heart. We, we, I'm not, I don't hate God. I don't love God. I'm neutral. There's no such thing. It's very binary in the Bible. You're on, you're on the broad path, you're on the narrow path. You're dark, you're light, you're heaven, you're hell. It's just, it's, it's very, it's, 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 you know, there's, two, there's no third choice. We're always trying to carve out a third choice, a third rail, right? We always want this third choice. Ah, I'm neutral. There's no neutrality in the Bible. If you do not love, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ and love him, then you are hostile, you are an enemy of God, you hate God. You may not display that in some perverse or, or outward way, but your heart is in enmity, hatred, hostility to God. There's no neutrality. And how do we tell? That you do not submit to God's law. The, 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 the mind that, that loves God loves his law. 
You don't hear that a lot. We love God, and we love God by submitting to his law. John 14, 15, Jesus said very clearly, if you love me, you'll what? You'll keep my commandments. If you love me, you'll pray praise songs and tears will come down from your eyes if you love me. Right? If you love me, you'll display some kind of supernatural gifting and you'll, you'll, you'll do something supernatural. If, if, if you love me, you'll listen to Caleb on your radio and you'll love those songs and you'll sing them back to your kids. If you, you'll love me, you, you'll buy all the, 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 the devotionals that are sold at the Christian bookstore. If you, what? No, if you love me, you will obey me. Simple but hard. That, that's the parental part. That's what we tell our kids all the time. I don't want to hear that you love me. I want you to show me by your actions. You prove your love by your actions. Love and obedience. Listen, I, I'm running out of time, but I want you to hear this. Love and obedience in the Bible are always linked. They're always linked. You love God, you obey Him. You can't separate those two, but we try our hardest to separate them. We love God. We love Jesus. You love grace. These are things we say, I love God's grace. I love God's mercy. I love God's faithfulness, right? We love all those things. But you know what? I never heard anyone ever say anything. I love God's law. <laughs> David said it, right? Oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it day and night. And, 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 and David said that in Psalm 119 before the new covenant, before Jesus, before all the good stuff, I guess you could say. I'm not saying there's not anything. I shouldn't have said it that way. Uh, <laughs> Shouldn't have said that. Erase that. The good stuff's all there. But before Jesus, that's the. St David says, "I love your law." You know, David says on a on a night when I have nothing to do in the palace, I don't. I try not to get in trouble, right? If I'm not getting in trouble, like I have done, David says, "I like to get a nice warm cup of something and pull up with a copy of Leviticus." Love it. Get my scroll of Leviticus out, and my heart is full of love and delight as I see a God who created me in his image and gives me the roadmap for life and, and loves me enough to show me in his law how to please him and live from all. Oh, it's I meditate on it day and night. I love it. I love it, David says. We should love God's law. We know it doesn't lead to salvation. We don't love his law for salvation, but as believers, we should love God's law. God has given us the commands we need to please him to live for him, to, to honor him, to be like him. We should obey God's law. Secondly, the Holy Spirit replaces who we please. It replaces our affection. It replaces who we please. Look at verse 8. We now live differently. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. You are no longer in the flesh. You're in the spirit. Your flesh is dead. Yes, your flesh is still bothersome to us, Romans chapter 7, but you are no longer categorized, defined by a slave of your sinful nature. You are free. And you know what that means? It means a lot of things, but you know what it means in verse 8? You can now live a life that pleases God. That's awesome. That's awesome. Think about it. There, there's what? How many billion of us on earth now? Nine? Are we up to nine billion? Are we beyond nine? We're somewhere there. Ten? Oh, I thought you were whispering to me. <laughs> Let's say there's nine billion of us. There, there's like 350, 400 million Americans. I think there's nine billion of us. And, and, and all of those people, all living at the same time, all doing our own things, in this moment of time, you can do something, think something that brings a smile to God's face. You! Little old you, in Millersburg, Pennsylvania, sitting in David's church in his pew, you can have a thought, a moment, you can have something happen right now in your pew, you can think something, confess something, and God can smile at that. That's all, that, come on, isn't that an amazing thought? You, who cares what goes on in your piddly brain, right? Who cares what you think? I don't. Your spouse might a little bit, a little tiny bit, but the God of the universe cares, and he is pleased. He can be pleased by you, and I just, you know, to think that we could do something as insignificant as we are to please the God of the universe, that's what it says. We can now please him when we live in the spirit, we walk according to the spirit and not in the flesh. We can please God. The world can't please God. We can please God. We have that privilege. We have that privilege, which brings me to the last point that we're just going to leave off on. We have a new goal in life now, and that goal is to please God. That's what you live for, not to please yourself, not to enrich yourself, 
not to make yourself happy, not even to make your spouse happy. That's a good goal, but that has to come under, God's, under God. You live now to please God. Every thought, every action, everything you do, you think, am I pleasing God with this? And sometimes we fall short of that. I do a lot of things I shouldn't do, and that doesn't please God. But that, that thought goes through our heads now. Does this bring pleasure to God? Does this glorify God? Can I glorify God in this? I want to please God. I don't want to please myself anymore. This list, the one that's filled out there, uh, the one in yellow there, is the sanctification list, right? The, the list on uh, your left is the fleshly list. The list on the right is the sanctification. Things of the Spirit. We want to walk by the Spirit. We want to please God. We want to set our minds to the Spirit. We want to love God, not be hostile to God. We want to submit to God's law, love God's law, and this will lead us to life and peace. That's the list that we seek after. That's the list we want to live by. That's what we want to be categorized. We have a new direction in life. If we're a Christian, we have a new mind with new thoughts. We have new affections, a new love in our heart, a love for God. We have a new goal in life to please God. This is who we are. If you are a Christian today, if you're not a Christian today, today's the day to repent and believe in Jesus Christ. But if you are a believer, this is your roadmap. This is your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. It is your day, the Lord's day, Sunday, the first day of the week we celebrate because you rose from the dead on this day 2,000 years ago. And by you raising on this Sunday, everything changes. Salvation has come to us. Justification and redemption has come to us, Lord. We can now know you through Jesus Christ. Because you rose from the dead, we can now have the Holy Spirit, God, living inside of us, ministering to us, empowering us, walking alongside of us, Lord. You ensured our salvation, and you keep our salvation safe and secure. And Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters here today that know you as their Lord and Savior, that we might walk in newness of life, that we might think new thoughts, godly thoughts. We might put those old thoughts. Lord, we entertain the flesh way too much. We give way too much space in our lives for the old flesh. Help us to turn from the old flesh, to live and walk in newness of life. Give us those new thoughts. Help us to think thoughts that are pleasing to you. Live a life that's pleasing to you, to love you. Lord, you've given us a, a, a love for you in our hearts. Help us to grow in that love. Help us to grow in that, walk in that, live in that, Lord. And I pray for those who don't know you as their Lord and Savior. I pray today would be the day of salvation, that they would see this teaching and a call to those who already know you as motivation to, to begin their walk, to begin their, their, their life with you. And today might be a day that they turn their lives over to you and believe and repent in you and invite Jesus to be their personal Lord and Savior. Lord, give us the strength to make this commitment today, to, to walk in newness of life. And we'll give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand as we dismiss. Remember the fall, is the fall festival this Saturday or next Saturday? Saturday. This Saturday. This Saturday is the fall festival. So uh, we need volunteers still. Please sign up. That's right outside. We have enough candy. Please, please. We have enough candy. More than enough. So, but you can still bring some, I guess. Oh, oh, Danny said, no, we can always use more. All right. So sign up, please. Be praying for that. Uh, that is this Saturday. If you have a youngster or people, kids in the neighborhood, please bring them out to that. It's a great event as well. But let me pray for us as we dismiss. Heavenly Father, I pray now that you would bless us and keep us, that you'd make your face to shine upon us, Lord, that you would be gracious towards us. I pray that you would turn your face towards us and bring us peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.